Okay, we've got the butt plate on uh, for for kind of the first setting. Now we're gonna we're gonna work on that again, but for now it's it's fine just where it is. Wash my hands, got rid of the black, and we're gonna go on to something that's a little bit more fun, which is shaping of the stock. Now this stock is pretty well shaped, but still there's gonna be a considerable amount of of rasping to do on it, and before we can do that. We've got to get rid of this. Is, this is another advantage of the swivel breech. You don't have to take it out of the, the whole rifle. Out. You can just, you can just twist this up. And again, this is where my rest comes in handy. You don't have to worry about that breaking off. My first thing I'm going to do is take the cock off here because it's going to be in, in our way. So here's the cock pulling right here. Hang on one second. Um, all right. Okay? Yep. All right, we just put that on. The, oh, good idea to take off the screw first. These cocks, where I get them from L and R, the hole in here is exactly wrong. So I have to weld the, the holes in and uh, re-drill them and make them square again. But an interesting little tool that does actually makes a square hole. Alright, we got the cock off of there, so that's out of the way. And I'm going to take the trigger guard off too. And the only thing that holds this trigger guard on is a screw that's in right here. That goes into the rear swivel plate. And this tab here on the trigger guard that goes in here and you pin it through here just like you would on, on, a, on a single barrel rifle. See the tab that goes in there. That hole is already cut mortised out for the for the trigger guard. But as you can see, the trigger guards they're just rough cast, so there's there's a bit of work to to file them down and file all the the bumps off them and emery paper it down and and polish it up. Uh, used to be one of my favorite jobs that if you get all the the arthritis gets in the hand that makes it very very hard. Now we will have to take the trigger out at some point but I'm going to leave it in right now because I like there's a screw that goes through the tang and into the plate and that holds everything nice and nice and tight very very sturdy. Now we can start right right down here This one is pretty good as far as the amount of extra wood is on it, so I think I will start out by doing the comb first. What we want to do is extend these two grooves back so that we'll, your hand will lay in there better. So I do that with a regular round rat tail file. It, uh, it takes a little, little bit of effort but pretty much self-directing itself. You just go in the groove that's already there and you aim this, this uh, part of the uh, file to leave the wood just about at the end of that screw and that'll give you the, that'll give you the right angle. No, there's no magic number. You want to get it down so 
so that it is in line with with this angle coming down here because eventually we're going to knock this bump off and, and smooth it down. And go right over to the other side and do exactly the same thing. Now if you look on, up on this side, just to show you, we're bringing that down so that eventually this edge here just comes down and conforms with, with the uh, cheek piece. When we take this wood off here, it'll, it'll look like this is swept down like that, so this big bump in here will have to be taken off. This happens very, very quickly. The butt plate went well this morning. We're a little over an hour doing putting the butt plate on, but uh, when you have to get the, the video lined up, I know it takes a little bit longer, but uh, that wasn't bad even at that. Now, I'm going to start taking this bump off in here. Now, these side panels here that are on here, I originally thought that we could, we could cut those in with the CNC machine, but tell you the truth, they're a pain in the neck. They're in the way. They're too high. So the last, the next group of stocks that I'm going to have cut, I'm, I'm going to eliminate that. It, uh, it doesn't hurt anything to have on there, but they're just in the way, and you'll see why uh, when we get to it. Now I'm going to just take that bump off of there. Actually, I'm going to move this, this stock back here a little bit further so I can get the angle. This is in my way. pretty close to what the finish will be. Now, one over here is a couple of guidelines. Now I like to go from the, from the tip of the lock plate to the center of the patch box and we'll put a line on there. This is just the guideline to keep everything even on either side. The other line we want, you can just barely I'm going to remark that. This is going to be the lower lower panel molding, and I like I like them to, to make them a half inch wide here. See, that's where the half inch is here, and down to about about a quarter or a little little wider by the time I get down here. So I'll just mark that on darker so we can see it. we want to do the same thing. Now this line will go from the tip here to the tip of the patch uh, cheek piece. Get a half inch here. I'll take a little wood off there on that before I mark that side. This side's pretty close.
I don't like to get down too too far on this side any more than absolutely necessary because there's eventually there'll be a carving on on this rifle if I finish it up. That's as much as I'm gonna take that down for now. Take a little off here right now. I chose this particular stock to do the tutorial on because it has a couple of little worm holes in it. I don't know if you can see them or not, but if I bring the light down here, you can see right there. I'm pretty sure I can get those out, but there's allowed to be one show up in another spot. But uh, somehow I always be able, been able to work around them. Now when you're doing this part here, kind of watching your your butt plate and you're watching your lines here that's what that straight line is on there for so that that you <coughs> keep it so you don't end up with a wavy line going across there See how I'm coming right, right onto that line. Now you can this <coughs> this gouge here is kind of a medium uh, grit on it. You can do this with a force of grit. It's a little hard for me these days, with elbows and shoulders. But uh, of course, the wood comes off a lot quicker with a big rasp. Notice I'm not going by that line. Eventually, <coughs> we've got to bring this down a little bit, but for now I want to leave that line. <coughs> and slowly, we're rounding this edge over. Now I'm watching this line on this side. You might, if you notice, I'm continuously moving this this light around. The the light going across the work is much more valuable. I mean, you have to have enough light to see everything, but when you get a, a, the light going across it at an angle, it can show you everything that you've got there. So, as I said before, I think that light is one of the most important things that you have on, <coughs> on your workbench. See, I'm slowly working my way to that pencil line. Now, if I didn't have that pencil line on there, I wouldn't know where I am. Yeah, you can see when I turn the stock, when I try, I try to keep my work surface, the part I'm working on, right in my face, right where it's easier so I'm not kneeling down or, or twisting around like a pretzel to get at. 
And with the swivel bridge, of course, it's nice because you can do it this way. But if I didn't, if I had a standard rifle in here, a regular rifle, these vices here will tilt. So if I wandered it over, I wandered over, I could tilt this. It'll tilt either way, towards me or away from me, but I can tip it over this way, and the rest still supports it there. So, these are not really big, heavy, rugged vices, but you don't need anything more rugged than these for what you're doing here. Uh, by the time you get the rif rifle to this point, it, you're not hogging off heavy chunks of wood, so... These vices are really nice, and these these clamps on the bottom, they'll swivel the other side, so that rifle will also tip over this way. And when you're carving, it's especially nice because you always have that right in front of you, and you bring your light over, and keep keep it lighting up the, the part <coughs> that you're working on. All right. I darken that line up so you can see it a little bit better. You can see I'm working my way towards it. You can see I'm a little closer down here, so now I know I have to take a little more up on this end. And I'm down to where I'm getting close to the patch box. Now I don't want to cut this back anymore until I get the patch box door in. At that time I'll draw a pencil line <coughs> around the door because there has to be a flat here for the door to slide in on. So I don't want to round this right to the edge. Once I draw the pencil line around where the patch box will actually be, then I can come back and finish bringing this right up to the edge of that line. But for now, that's as far as I'm going to go there. This side here, we can take a little more in here. And uh, a little more to do here to bring up to that line. One of the things that I want to point out is no matter what you're doing on here, whether it's sanding or whatever, you want to use the coarsest tool that you can use for that job. If you've got a you know an eighth of an inch of wood to come off, you know don't start with fine paper. Use a use a good coarse wrap. Get it down there where it's almost right to your line where you want to be. Then then go to your your paper. If you if you try take hog and water off with sandpaper, it just takes hours and hours and hours. And it, uh, it takes long enough to build them without you know, adding any extra to it. Now, I'm going to take the, the top of the comb down right to the top of the, of the brass. Now, what you want to be careful here is this, on this style of rifle, it's flat right from here to the top of the comb. So what you want to do every once in a while is put a straight edge on it, get down on the side and look and make sure that you're not making a little dish in it. It can happen very, very easily. So we're going to start taking that off now. Once we get this down pretty close to where the finish will be, we'll put another pencil in it. Oftentimes, I'm tempted to go a little too coarse and put one of <clears throat> one of these on it, but 
this really is coarse and it's not going to make some scratches that will be too deep for you to get out. If it was a little, little higher than that, I would though. Very hard for me to see some of this stuff now. I've got macro degeneration on my left eye. And it's certainly not helping me, but it hasn't stopped me. Yeah, I'm very close there right now. Good. Now I'm going to put the lines back on. Now we'll go right to right to that corner and right to that corner. It's pretty much there, isn't it? You can see that I'm not quite up to the line here. But without those lines, it'd be very hard to tell. see that the butt plate overlaps like quite a bit so I'm going to mark that right now when I take it off I'll cut that back actually I like to leave the butt plate just about a 30 second longer than the toe plate and uh, I don't know if that's according to Hoyle or not but it just makes sense to me that protects the the toe plate from from getting marked. <clears throat> All right, now you notice the the lock is inlet below the face of the wood. And what we want to end up with is this surface of the wood should be at the bottom edge of the bevel. So that, uh, let me get a lock plate. It's easy to explain. All right, here's the, here's the lock plate. You can see, here's the bevel. So you really are going to end up inletting that just, just the width of that flat right there on top. And that barrel, that right now, this wood is about at the top flat. So we're going to be taking some of that off. I'll just leave that here for further reference. Uh, <clears throat> now, these lobes here, really, as I said before, they're really just in the way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start up here about a sixteenth of an inch away from the from the lock plate and I'm going to gradually get wider as I go to the back and bring it down and remember we put this center line on here 
and this point will end up coming right right to there and this side the same thing I'm gonna go from here there's a little belly in it there and then this is going to come over here like that and the best way to do that is with a gouge so we're gonna cut this down eventually put that load back on there but not just yet It's looking better. All right, we're going to be dealing with this line here again, the one that goes from the point here down to the center of the patch box, and we keep our eye on that. And we're just we're just going and making this rounding this up here. being sure not to go over that line. Now we're going to have to take that trigger out in order to get this so we might as well do it right now. Yep. Just back that screw a little bit. Get that trigger guard started out because they are in there snug. I like this screw to go through from the tang through the trigger guy because it acts like a clamp and it, it in, increases the strength to the wrist here by clamping it this way. And then the, there's another screw that goes across from the other side from plate to plate that clamps it this way. And if you look at the inside of these when, when all the metal is out of there, there's very little wood left in there so it's very vulnerable to being broken. So the, these clamps that are both ways uh, that's no accident. I did that on purpose for strength. Now, this wood right now is just a little proud of the swivel action, so we don't want to mark up the, the action itself. 
so we just want to get get close to it. That line I put on there is not very clear, but I'm doing now is I'm just making it a nice curve from the pencil line that I put around here to the trigger guard. You don't need much wood here between the plate and where you start to round it. The, uh, it makes a nice slim rifle when you bring that down fairly close. I like to see 3 30 seconds to an eighth of an inch. We'll take that a little more when we get to the sandpaper. never did finish putting our molding line on the other side, but we can do it now. Now, you can see this is high here. If we put our straight edge on here, you see it, it's got a bump there. So we're going to take this, this down a little bit here. If you get your, your gouge nice and sharp, you can actually use it like a plane. And when you're using a rasp or a file or whatever, use good sharp ones. Using old, worn out files and rasps are just a big, big waste of time. So you can tell when you get a good, good sharp one. You can hear it cutting. Yeah, that's good. Now I'll just put a little sandpaper on it so we can draw a line on there. When I'm sanding, I like to use a, a stand, sanding stick and I put a piece of leather on it. It makes a nice cushiony side. It seems to help to help you just get the feel of it a little bit better. I'm just doing the sandpaper now for the molding so that we can get that. And that molding will work directly with the rest of these moldings. I just want to get this flat and straight. Now, same as the other side, we'll give ourselves a half an inch here. Hardest thing for me here is being able to see. See, 
where this one here ends right here. So we'll just put a line right across here. Make that a quarter inch. A little big there now. So we'll make this one a quarter inch. And this will come down here. Like that. It has a little curve to it. And then it will be round on the end here. Bring that. You can see right here, I'm not quite over to the pencil line here, so I just want to bring this up to touch that pencil line. This is just freehand in this. When we get ready to cut it, the gouges and chisels will make the perfect circle so we don't have to worry about them right, right now. at a little different angle you see it a little differently okay this side we're going to shape around the, the release uh, panel side we do basically the same as we did on the other side is we're just gonna eliminate that See what a, an advantage it is to having a good sharp chisel. Turn this up. This I thought by putting these on, it would be a help, but uh, really they're more of a pain in the neck. Well, I'm going to put those side these panels back on, uh, but we got to get down, get the stock down a little thinner before we do that. This we can, we can bring up here a little ways. Get over the other side.
Remember, we're trying to end up on this line. watching for how far to bring this up so I'm back here so I want to bring that up to about there and this is going to end up as a raised panel you could do this with a gouge but when you've got a really curly piece of wood Sometimes it can tear out and we don't have any room here for error. When I used to teach in the shop, I used to tell the students not to worry. They couldn't make a mistake that I couldn't fix. <laughs> and I was tested many times, but I always managed to come up with something. at this to flow right up in a nice a nice even curl See that this this tang is actually in in the mortar steeper, so we're going to have to come down to that. So when we start getting close to that, I'll switch to a to a metal file. Taking those, those moldings off. Again, I'm watching this line, so I, I'm going to keep a high spot right where that, right where that line is. smoothed up a bit we'll put a new molding on here the molding will come down here and then we will have our molding back down here and we'll just lower this wood that's around the outside of it but for now we're just gonna leave it like that Try to shape this up 
up here a bit. And you see with the light going across, you can see all the high, high spots. pencil line on here so we don't go below that. You can see it's starting to look like something already. Die on that pencil line. Normally, I'd, I'd do this with a round gouge, but my fingers just aren't strong enough to hold them anymore, so I just use a piece of 120 paper. A little easier for me to control, and it doesn't cut as quickly, of course. You can see the difference of when you have the light straight on, you really can't see what you've got. But when you turn it down, the shadow will show that to you. You can see we're already getting a nice shape here. This will just run up here and just kind of run out and disappear. want to make sure they both come up <clears throat> and end pretty much in the same place. And again, stopping at the line that's here, now the line has kind of disappeared, so I'll put that back just so that you realize what we're doing. Many of these as I've done, I still, still really need the line to, to guide me. Same thing on the bottom side of this panel. <clears throat> I want to have that nice curve going up there on both sides and both ending at the same place. So this one is <coughs> ending about here, so that's, we don't want to go beyond there. This wood is quite hard, but it's so dry. I've had this in my, in my shed for over 30 years. makes it easy to work on when it's nice and dry. <clears throat> so you can see we're starting to get something that's got a little, little shape to it. I'm just 
taking that bump off that was left from putting that radius in there. Notice how close my light is. That's what's showing me what I need to see. If that light was way up here, it's bright enough, but I can't see the shadows going across. So you bring it down here and you can see them. If you come over here, you'll see I'm trying to emphasize the use of the light. It doesn't look, doesn't look too bad when you're looking on it here, but when you put the light over here, you can see. I keep hopping on the sharp chisels, but I want to say the same thing about your sandpaper also. <coughs> That's one of those wormholes right there. See if I can eliminate that. Sometimes you get down in there, it gets bigger instead of smaller. That one's pretty much staying the same. I think I'm going to leave well enough alone with that. Put my molding mark back on here. Yeah. These moldings are the easiest thing to do. <clears throat> and they make such a big difference on a rifle. <laughs> that macro degeneration, it makes, it makes lines look wavy, <laughs> sure. Sure doesn't help me. Okay. Now, what I wanna do is to put this molding in. This has gotta go in first and then we'll draw, draw our molding on here. And then we'll lower the wood in between the two and then lower it <clears throat> back away. So, let's, let's do this molding. Um, what do you mean about uh, doing the moldings? Mm -hmm. Oh, 
All right, we've got our molding lines on both sides, and this is where they end. And we're going to stamp a cut right in the end of where that molding will be, and lower the wood on this side of the line. That'll make the, the molding stand out. And we'll cut a, a, a line right on this pencil line and lower the wood on this side, and then we'll have a raised molding. Uh, these little palm chisels work great for this. If you need a bunch of them, they're a lot less money than the bigger ones, and they, they work very well, And uh, if, especially when you, you need different uh, radiuses and all. And what I'm going to do right here is put it right there. That's all it takes. And do the other side. Okay, now we've got the curve cut. And now we'll cut the line in this couple of ways you can do this line. Some people like to take a a very small veiner and and cut the line down with the veiner. Uh, I I prefer to use just one of the old fashioned I think they call these exacto knives. Now, that's one way to do it. And you just go over the line. But when you're making your second pass, you don't want to get careless. I don't have the power to get as deep as I want to get. So, what we'll do is take the chisel and deepen it. You can see the, the value of my rest here. You wouldn't want to be tapping on this without something supporting underneath it here. And you don't, you don't want to go any deeper than necessary, but don't get paranoid about it because if you go a little deeper than the cutter is going to end up being, it uh, it's not going to show. But 
try to stay reasonably the right depth. This knife here, this I call this the Bivens knife. John Bivens showed me how to make this. Actually, he gave it gave me one just like this. But I don't think my hands are strong enough to do that now, but I'm just going to do a little bit of it just to show you the whole idea of it. But my hands are aching now, so I'm not going to do that. And uh, you just have to be very careful when, you, when you're using this. But if you have it as sharp as this one is, you can see how nice it's, it's cutting there. Tell you the truth, I think this is the easy way anyway. These little palm chisels also work well for something like what I'm doing here. But when you do it this way, you want to be sure that that chisel is razor, razor sharp and get a hold, get, get your fingers up on it and get complete control of it so that, so that it doesn't slip out on you and go too far. A palm chisel like this one here might even be better for me at this point because you don't have to squeeze it so tight. You go in there but it's a little little too tight a radius on it. So I'll stick with this one. And you can also do this with with your with your mallet. If your hands are, are as bad as mine or worse. This molding only has to be about a sixteenth of an inch to be effective. In fact, it can even be a little narrower than that. But I like it to stand out. And when you when you're doing a carving. You're pretty much doing the same thing as what I'm doing here. You draw the outline with your knife or your gouges and then come in and lower the wood up to your line. I find most people are usually surprised when they, they hear that I take most of the background out of my carving area by going cross grain, which is what I'm doing right here. Which is absolutely no problem when you've got a good sharp gouge. We're down into, so the, all of a sudden we have a nice molding there. Now we want to take that point off so that it, it just tapers down into it very nicely. And you can do that with your the back side of your, your chisel and use it just like a plane.
but it, it takes a little, little control to do it. You don't want to be in a, in a real rush. You don't want to jump over that line. You can also do this with a file. If you have a file that has a, a safe side on it, I have one here like this. It's got a smooth edge on it and you can lay it in here and do it that way. That's a lot slower, but if you don't have the control of your chisel, it's it's a lot safer to use that. Is that light all right for you, Lily? Yep. And you want to be aware when the grain starts to change direction, which it is right here. Another way you can do this when you get to a point where you don't have have such a, a definite point, so you don't have to take so much wood off. You can use, and I don't have any scrapers. Uh, most gun builders do. I use my chisels, and I find that. If, if you got a good sharp chisel, you can see how nice it, it will scrape. Get the light on there so we can see that. Oh, we just lost our bulb. 